Hey everyone, so um, this is the chapter 14 admin lecture for the Medic 225 class. Um, we are talking about telephone techniques this week. It's not a very long lecture. If you've already read the chapter or uh, gone through the homework, started on the homework, you probably figured out this isn't a very long lecture. Um, it is an important one though, even though it's kind of short, uh, there's some good stuff in here for you to know because when you are working in the medical office, you do tend to spend quite a bit of time on the phone. So here's the thing, if you are anything at all like me, you probably hate being on the phone now. We now live in a generation and a society where texting has become a much faster and much easier form of communication. Um, I will now uh, be more likely to avoid talking to people uh, if I know that I can text or email them. And uh, it wasn't always like that. I am a little bit uh, older than most of you. And so there was um, a, a pretty recent time maybe 10 years ago or so where it was I was actually uh, of the opposite belief where I would rather just talk to somebody than take the time to text them but that was also the time where texting required uh, us to hit a button two or three or four times depending on which key it was in order to get each letter so um, you know we didn't have a full QWERTY keyboard on our phones we didn't have a full you know, a smartphone that could operate an entire third world government. And so um, it's crazy how far technology has come in such a short amount of time. And so um, we have become much more accustomed to not having to speak to one another on the phone. Unfortunately, in our line of work, that is not a realistic possibility um, that it's it's never going to be that we can avoid talking to people on the phone. So it is important that we know our phone etiquette and that we are aware of how to communicate with one another appropriately on the phone and that you understand that, um, you know, communicating on the phone at work is always going to be quite a bit different than it is when you're communicating on the phone uh, with your friends or with your relatives. So. Uh, the things that we want to find out by going through this map and through the chapter, again, we, as usual, we always start over here with our list of questions. We want to know what is the purpose of the telecommunications equipment commonly found in the medical office. We want to know how are the five C's of effective communications of telephone, uh, how are those five C's of effective communications uh, related to telephone communication skills. I forgot a word there, so sorry about that. Um, so this should say right here, how are they? I just completely drew over that, so hold on. Let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. So I'm just going to draw a little arrow over here. Related to and uh, how do these terms, the next question, how do these terms make a good impression on the telephone? And those terms are telephone etiquette, pitch, pronunciation, enunciation, and tone. The next question, how do we appropriately handle the different types of calls coming into the medical practice? There are a number of different types of calls we get pretty consistently. Uh, what is the office routing list and call screening? What are those two things and how do we handle those? Uh, how do I take a complete telephone message? You'd be surprised uh, how thorough you have to be when taking a phone message. And what should I do to be prepared to make a professional outgoing call? So uh, we have all of these things that we're going to talk about about incoming calls, and but then we need to figure out what we need to do in order to make a professional outgoing call as well. All right, so we begin by uh, talking about the parts of the telephone system or the pieces of telecommunications equipment that you will commonly find in the office. And so this isn't really anything that's exclusive to a medical office. Um, it's pretty common stuff that you'll find basically in any office. Um, but 
it is uh, stuff that you will find in the medical office as well. So the telephone system uh, up here is one of the most important pieces of communication equipment in the office. Usually the office will have a system with multiple lines along with an intercom, intercom system and the ability to transfer calls, leave voicemails, and then also put calls on hold. And so you will often see um, these uh, phones and they have um, you know multiple lines across the top and a hold button transfer buttons actually I'm gonna pause this really quick and see if I can put a picture in here really quick hang on just a second okay let me scroll down I think I found one I put in here so here you can kind of see uh, what a typical multi-line phone looks like or what a typical office phone looks like this is actually kind of an older model but you can kind of see um, what this looks like here and or you can see that um, normally these were uh, the multiple lines so like here would be uh, probably line um, one and two and three I don't know if I can write on this picture oh yeah I can so this may be like line one line two line three line four so um, those could also be programmed for specific functions on this phone. I'm not sure. I can't. The LCD screen is off, so I can't tell. But my best guess is that this, these are probably the lines. Um, the directory here is where all of the uh, phone numbers are stored. So like the speed dial, um, if you are old enough to remember what speed dial is. Um, but the this also looks like is a uh, speed dial. Um, here, so we have volume buttons here, speakerphone here, which is really great for conference calls, mute button, which is also really great for conference calls, and uh, a headset button here, and then navigation, so to push up and down, and um, a little uh, indicator button here to tell you that there's a voicemail that is waiting for you, so if it's blinking red, there's probably a voicemail. And it looks like um, I'm trying to find the transfer button, but I don't really see one. So um, that may be an option that's on the screen. Like you might um, need to hit one of these buttons. That maybe that's what these are here. Um, maybe the line buttons. Oh, it does say line up here. So it may give you options when the screen lights up here to transfer lines. And there may be a transfer button here and a hold button here once the screen is lit. So, um, but this is kind of what a basic office phone looks like. It has hold and transfer buttons. Um, gives you an idea of what a typical uh, multi-line phone would look like. So uh, usually the multiple uh, the office will have a system with multiple lines along with an intercom system. The intercom system um, very rarely is used in a medical office. I cannot recall a time in the 20 nearly 20 years now that I've been working in healthcare where a uh, an intercom system has been utilized in an office setting. I I know that they are frequently utilized in uh, the hospital setting um, in an ambulatory care setting but not necessarily in an office setting it's just weird um, and not really necessary to do so in an office setting so I wouldn't expect that that would have changed uh, since you know I last worked in an office setting um, so an automatic voice response unit is uh, basically an automatic answering uh, unit that routes a patient's call to the appropriate area when a number uh, uh, is pushed and it will not always be appreciated by a person who wants to um, have the phone answered by a live person and so basically I know for a fact that if you have called anybody ever in your life you have probably heard what an automatic voice response unit does so they're the person who answers the phone and they're like thank you for calling Domino's Pizza if you would like to place an order press 1 if you would like to talk to a live person in the store press 2 if you would like to have the store hours press 3 
it's that is what an automatic response unit does. So um, those are super annoying for people who want to talk to a live actual person, but they are really efficient in helping to get people to the right area as long as people are patient enough to follow the prompts and answer the questions, the prompt questions correctly enough to get them to the right um, department. So for the instances um, where people are impatient or they really just want to talk to a live person, we can give them, it may be advisable that uh, an office may want to uh, include a number to push to speak with the operator or the office manager. Typically people will bypass that if they're, they're like me and they're mad and they just want to talk to a live person, they just start hitting zero. Um, and that's typically the number to get to somebody that's live uh, and that will speak with them. So the voicemail uh, is helpful when the office is closed or no one is available to answer the phone. It is, as an alternative, an answering machine may also be used to convey the message on how to contact the covering physician. Can you hear my dog's argument back there? Uh, how to contact the covering physician in case of an emergency. I, I'm not sure that a lot of people use answering machines anymore. There may be places that still do, but uh, voicemail usually does the trick. Some offices will also use an answering service for times when the office is closed and to triage calls to the physicians. So here's the thing, um, answering services are different than voicemails and answering machines. It is actually a service that will uh, triage calls. They take calls from patients after hours and then they will page the physician and have the physician call you, the patient, or call a patient back. Um, depending on whether or not the physician needs to speak with the patient due to the severity of symptoms after the office has been closed for the evening. All right, so let me follow. Look, do you see how cute this is? I put little phone cords in here as connectors today. How adorable, right? Not really. Trying to be creative there. Okay. Over here to the telecommunications equipment, the second part, cell phones, uh, cell phone usage. Everybody's got a cell phone. Okay, not everybody, but most people have cell phones. And uh, I would say the large majority of the population has cell phones. Uh, the usage has become widespread. It has replaced many types of traditional phone systems. I mean, as little as seven, six, seven years ago, I refused to get rid of my home phone, my landline. Um, and then, you know, like one by one, our kids started getting cell phones too. And now we haven't had a landline in five years. So, I mean, just that quick, within two years, things changed enough that I was like, ah, oh, we don't need to pay for this anymore. So, I mean, it's become very, very widespread and you guys don't need me to tell you that. So, uh, physicians and office staff, uh, of course, have cell phones most oftentimes too, and they may use their personal cell phones in an emergency. Um, most of the time they'll try, especially physicians, will try to leave their personal cell phones private um, and off limits for office use. Um, but in times of an emergency, sometimes, you know, we have to do what we have to do. So offices may also have a cell phone that is issued to key employees so that they can conduct business for the practice outside of the office. Uh, it, when I worked for an infertility office, we had um, a uh, pager, uh, which we're going to talk about in just a second, issued to us. And one of us, we had a cell phone that went back and forth between us. It was a flip phone. It was very old. It was when cell phones were still an emerging technology. And uh, it went with whoever was on call for the week. And um, we took it with us so that way we did not have to use our own uh, cell phones because we were still paying per minute. Uh, for our cell phones then. So, um, you know, that was nice to have because then we didn't have to use our own, you know, minutes and, and all of those things. So uh, that may be something that you encounter while working in the office. The problem with cell phones, as is the case in classrooms and homes and everywhere else, 
across the world is that in medical offices they can also interfere uh, in a number of ways and one of those ways that they can interfere is with other electronic equipment such as EKG machines um, and various things uh, EKG machines most often though in the, in the medical office um, but they can there's some other things that they can interfere with but that's usually the primary one um, but they uh, sometimes you'll see signs that are posted warning against the use of cell phones but moreover cell phones sometimes are an invasion of privacy in a medical office and so patients may need to be reminded uh, very gently that they can only use their cell phones in, in specially designated areas not only for interference with the medical equipment but also because it's you know a HIPAA violation uh, in some instances so um, some practitioners are still pretty old school they rely on a pager if you do not know what a pager is I will let you Google that um, I got my first pager in 1996 and I was pretty excited about that sometimes they're called beepers uh, beepers were the coolest thing ever in 1996 I would just like for you to know that um, if a cell phone coverage is weak or unavailable, like if there's no cell towers, uh, sometimes in very rural areas where cell coverage and service is very spotty and unreliable, um, practitioners will still rely on um, pagers to uh, respond to pages or to uh, calls. So the way pager works is, uh, it has a phone number attached to it and my dogs are going to come back inside so if they bark I apologize ahead of time uh, if the pager has a phone number attached to it and um, so somebody from the office calls this phone number and they type in a message or a phone number and um, um, you know asking them to return the call and then the practitioner will um, then note to return the call to the number that comes up on the screen basically thankfully you don't have to go to pay phones to make those return calls now because we have cell phones so that's nice um, but the pager can often be accessed and called from a computer uh, which makes the messaging much more efficient now than it was in the early to mid 90s um, interactive pagers are a newer technology than uh, we had 20 years ago and those allow the person to respond right through the paging unit so that's very nice as well so one thing that you um, will probably have in the medical office that may be a little bit different than most typical offices uh, uh, is a telecommunication device for the deaf and those are becoming more common with advancing technology uh, and it's helpful to know common abbreviations that are used by the TDD machine um, but it resembles a laptop and it will is basically a relay system to help uh, those who are hearing uh, disabled speak and communicate speak so to speak I guess and uh, communicate with a person on the other end of the phone so that's nice all right so we go down to talk about how to effectively communicate over the phone and we start with talking about um, communication skills and how important they are when we are talking over the telephone so even though we aren't face to face with the person on the other end of the phone uh, the person should be able to know that you are conveying tact and sensitivity empathy and respect um, while you are on the phone with them at all times and so the person's approach your approach as a professional calling from the office should be genuinely open uh, and friendly in order to be effective so my kids make fun of me all of the time because um, they uh, talk about how I have this uh, whole fake voice that I put on uh, as soon as I get on the phone with somebody from work or um, with uh, some kind of professional phone call and uh, how that voice is completely different than it is when I'm talking to my sister or when I'm talking to my mom or you know when I'm talking to a friend and so uh, that's true it's definitely true in fact um, 
I don't even deny that, not at all, uh, because I try to be a little bit more professional while I am dealing with uh, certain facets of people and uh, or working um, rather than, you know, talking with my sister. So, um, or talking with my husband or talking with the kids. So if you could hear how often I scream things in my house at my children, he would probably be appalled. So it's probably a good thing, you know, that I, that you, we turn on our other voice, um, when we go to work, because if we screamed the way at our patients, the way that we sometimes have to yell at our children to get them to do the things we want them to do, then we probably wouldn't have a job very long. So in order to make sure that we are communicating effectively, you need to make sure that while you're on the phone with patients and while you're on the phone with other people uh, through your uh, course of employment and communicating on behalf of the office, that you are doing so in a manner that uh, allows the caller to know that you are a f a friendly and that you are genuine and uh, that you are receptive and uh, respective of their uh, reason for calling. And so while you sometimes may be attempted to pass judgment on a caller, and believe me, that happens a lot when you work in a medical office, um, it's super important not to stereotype others. It's easy to want to. It is incredibly important to not allow yourself to get in the headspace where that becomes an opportunity for you. Um, you cannot uh, allow yourself to go there because if you do, uh, it will affect the way that you speak and communicate with the person on the other end of the phone and that will influence your conversation. Instead, the goal is to be supportive and ask for clarification and ask for feedback. So if you don't understand something that the caller is saying, it is entirely okay to politely and as professionally as possible ask for clarification and say, hey, I just want to make sure I understand what it is that you are asking or what it is you would like for me to help with. And then ask for feedback and say, did I am I did I get everything that you needed me to, to do or did I get answer all of your questions today did I uh, you know help you the best way that you know I could today or uh, you know things like that paraphrasing also helps ensure that the message from the caller is understood so you know after they have spoken for a while and tried to explain the problem just say okay, I just want to make sure I understand you would like for me to have the doctor call you to discuss the recent symptoms that you're having, uh, experiencing night sweats after the change of medication last week. Is that right? Does that sound right? And then have them tell you yes or no, or say, no, 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 that it's not the night medication, it's the daytime medication that I'm having problems with. Say, oh, okay, see, I just want to make sure. Um, so paraphrase as you go along so that way you can make sure that um, you, you can get feedback from them. While being receptive to each patient's needs, you want to know when to speak and then also when to listen. You know, moms all around the world have been telling their kids for years that you listen with your ears and not with your mouth. And that applies to you working in an office as well. You listen with your ears and not with your mouth. One of the most frustrating things in the world is when people interject and cut you off. And so um, it, while time is, of course, always a very valuable commodity in a medical office um, and no one wants to sit on the phone and listen to somebody for hours and hours, uh, and sometimes elderly people will uh, gladly let you sit on the phone for hours and hours uh, and tell you everything, everything, and sometimes it's not even just elderly people, sometimes it's just people in general that are lonely or like to listen to themselves talk. Um, you should try to let them speak uh, and say what they need to say so that you can get the gist of what it is they're calling about so that you can figure out how to help them and then speak only when you know it's appropriate to speak. So try not to cut them off if you don't have to. I understand that there is a time sometimes where it's necessary to cut them off in order to keep the conversation flowing. Um, if that happens, you need to politely interject and say, okay, I just want to make sure... Uh, 
uh, pardon me, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. And then that's when you paraphrase, uh, that will that will politely interject, cut them off, get the conversation back on track, and uh, move the conversation forward. There must be a willingness on your part to consider other viewpoints and concerns of the caller as well. And so, you know, sometimes you may have to check your own beliefs at the door. One thing that I struggle uh, a great deal with in, in this line of work and in, in working in healthcare is, um, and this is a personal opinion uh, backed with a lot of science, but it's a personal uh, belief of mine is that uh, you should vaccinate your children. And uh, I'm, I've done a lot of research uh, in the field of vaccinations. And uh, so vaccinations are kind of a, a, a tough sell for me. And so I have had to um, have conversations over the phone and face to face with people who are pushing the anti-vax movement uh, to me. And I have to consider the things that they say um, and allow them, as they allow me, the courtesy to agree to disagree as respectfully and professionally as possible. So just know that sometimes things are going to come up that you don't necessarily agree on, and that's okay. Uh, the world is a beautiful place because we don't all agree on the same things. And so uh, that's how progress is made sometimes. So when uh, patients uh, are calling, they appreciate the phone being answered promptly. And uh, you want to greet the caller with the practice name followed by the name of the person answering the phone. You want to be patient even if you are busy and in a hurry. Nobody likes to sound, uh, nobody likes to be made to feel like they have annoyed someone. That is kind of hurtful. Um, if, at best, it's annoying, and at worst, it's hurtful. You want to be mindful of the caller and do not multitask. As you could probably tell in the background here, I'm like scolding my dogs and uh, trying to record this lecture because it's getting late and I should have had it posted yesterday. And so I'm trying to multitask, and you probably can tell that I'm trying to multitask because my voice is kind of going in and out and you can hear all this background noise and it's annoying. You deserve better than that for me as your professor. Unfortunately, you're not going to get it today. But your patients <laughs> deserve better than that from you as a professional at the office. So don't multitask. Pay attention to your caller. Uh, you should allow the caller to hang up first, always, but always say goodbye and use the caller's name. So um, don't ever hang up first, and but you should always make sure that you say goodbye call them by their name, and then let them hang up before you hang up. You want to use HIPAA guidelines. Um, make sure that those are always followed. Patient information should never be revealed over the phone without written consent from the patient. That has to be signed prior to you revealing information to them over the phone, even if the information is to them about them. It's also against HIPAA standards to reveal the patient uh, if uh, reveal that the patient has an appointment, that the patient is in the office, or that the patient is being treated if the patient has not consented to release of that information, even if that information, again, is to the patient about that patient. So even if it's about themselves, you can't reveal any of those things. Um, and also, if that's to their spouse, those are HIPAA guidelines. So HIPAA is very strict. It's a federal law. Uh, you will lose your job for HIPAA violation very quickly uh, because that is a hefty fine. So you want to be very mindful of not violating those HIPAA privacy guidelines. Okay, so let's see where I drew a little phone cord to over here now. Oh, here we go up here. All right, so uh, talking about telephone etiquette, pronunciation and enunciation consist of saying words correctly, clearly, and with distinction. So pronunciation is saying the word correctly. Enunciation is saying them clearly and with distinction. So you want to pronounce words correctly and then make sure that you are saying them clearly enough and distinctly enough that people can understand them. Now sometimes phones are muffled and so it's hard to understand those words clearly uh, and distinctly 
even if you are pronouncing them correctly. So just be mindful of that. You want to try to speak as clearly and concisely as possible um, so that you are always leaving uh, the caller uh, completely aware of what it is that you are saying to them and that there's never any confusion about what's being said. You always want to speak with a positive and respectful tone. Above all, you want to be kind. Even on the days where you least feel like being kind, you be kind. You never, ever, ever, ever know what the person on the other side of the phone is going through or what they are having done or what they are calling for or what's going on. So you just, it's our job to help create an environment of caring and of patient comfort and so that is what you are to do. Uh, you are to uh, maintain a positive and respectful tone and uh, be aware of the fact that if you cannot do this, uh, maintain a, a positive and respectful tone and be kind to the patients and to the caller, then you are probably in the wrong profession. Your patient should never ever experience your bad days. That's just how it is for us. Uh, I got a little smiling dog here. It's adorable, right? It actually kind of looks like my uh, one of my dogs, and so I found the smiling dog and I thought it was so cute. Smiling can be noted even over the phone. Uh, they say that you can smile and a smile can be heard over the phone. I don't know anybody that really like smiles a whole lot <laughs> over the phone, but uh, you can definitely hear when people are like in a, in a better mood over the phone, I feel like. And so uh, if you feel like you're in a really bad place that day or you're just having a rough time and you're not sure how you're going to convey any positive attitude or respectful tone, then freaking smile. Just smile while you're talking to people and that will help you. Uh, at least uh, sound a little bit better uh, while you're talking to people. So, and other things that you need to note, an attitude of helpfulness exhibits courtesy. Undivided attention should be given to the um, caller rather than attempting to multitask. We talked about that a little bit. And you want to, I'm going to pull this up here really quick. You want to, oh, hold on just a second. Let me find this, the highlighter. There we go. One more time. Oh, where's my highlighter guy? There he is. Oh, sorry. I thought I had him. My touch screen on my computer is like right underneath the um, where the uh, recorder line is, and so it's driving me nuts. Um, so if a person must be placed on hold, you should always ask permission and wait for a response. So don't just say, I'm going to place you on hold for a second, and then click put them on hold. Just say, may I place you on hold for just a moment, please, and then wait for them to tell you yes or no. 95% of the time they're going to tell you, okay, or I guess, or sure, or yes, even though they don't really want to be put on hold because literally nobody in the free world wants to be put on hold. Being put on hold is the most boring waste of time ever, but we get it. Sometimes we have to be put on hold. It's okay. Uh, but it's the common courtesy to ask somebody for permission to put them on hold and then at least give them the courtesy of waiting for a response. It gives them the power to choose whether or not to be put on hold or to tell you to give them a call back. A patient may be preferred, may prefer, so let me highlight this here. So uh, ask permission, this is important, and wait for a response. And the other thing is a patient may prefer to be called back in a reasonable amount of time, but it's a good practice to thank them for their patience. So uh, you always want to say thank you so much for being patient. I'll get, be back with you just as soon as I can, um, but always offer to call them back too. You know, say if you can't hold, it's okay. I can give you a call back in 20 minutes or and within the hour. I can give you a call back. Is there a better time if I can't reach you within the hour? 
Patients appreciate also being remembered by name, uh, so it's good to call them by name as often as you can, as long as you aren't violating HIPAA. Um, by if you know if there's somebody standing close to you, like another patient at the window, or you know anything like that. So if you can, uh, you know, call people by name. That's always good too. Just think about that. If you are a Starbucks junkie, I'm a huge Starbucks junkie. So if you are a Starbucks junkie, you can appreciate when you go into the same Starbucks. Uh, enough times that the barista remembers your name or the barista starts to remember your drink. So I went to the same Starbucks for years, like eight years before we moved here, almost every morning on the way to work, right? And then uh, we moved here and I was so sad because like I had to go to a whole new Starbucks and nobody knew my name and nobody knew my drink. And I know that seems stupid and privileged and like the whitest sounding problem ever. Um, and in a way it is, and I own that and I respect that. But the truth is those stupid little nuances in the day make you feel a little less alone in like this huge world, you know, especially when you're brand new in a place that you've never lived in a state with people that you don't know and you're 3,000 miles away from your whole family. So when I, you know, had gone to the Starbucks in town here enough that um, the people started to recognize my face and then eventually kind of knew my name and then eventually kind of knew my drink and then eventually kind of put the two and two together and now they're just like, uh, hey Jessica. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of nice, you know? So imagine what that feels like for a patient who entrusts you with their medical care in your office with their medical care. I mean, if I'm that, you know, appreciative of just having somebody who makes my freaking morning coffee know my name, I mean, you can bet that I sincerely appreciate having the staff at my doctor's office know my name right down to the receptionist or the front office MA. So put the extra effort in and try to remember your patients' names. They will thank you for it. Um, for long or complicated calls, you want to ask questions. Ask for questions on the material discussed or have the patient repeat the information back. I would go for re having the information repeated back um, or you know, if you don't feel comfortable having them repeat the information back to you, you could always just say, hey, uh, uh, could you let me know again what, it's, it's just, even if you have to pose like you forgot, you know, could you say, could you remind me, I forgot, I, I'm writing, I'm charting down what it is that we were talking about, could you tell me what it is uh, I just told you to pick up from the pharmacy? And that way you can quiz them and uh, so to speak without them necessarily knowing that you're quizzing them. And, uh, you know, if you're worried about, you know, perhaps having them repeat things back. But it's always okay to have them just say, I just want to make sure we're on the right track. Would you mind repeating what, what we just talked about back so I can make sure that I didn't miss anything. Um, sometimes patients are nervous, uh, upset, or angry when they call. And so it's super important then that we communicate with empathy um, and that will help convey a positive impression. You know when you're mad, uh, it sucks when people are uh, also mad and two mad people yelling at each other never makes anything better. So usually when people are mad, it isn't necessarily that they want to um, have somebody um, you know, to yell at or to take their aggressions out on, it's really more that they just want the problem fixed. And so, let me see if I can write this over here. Let me see if I can put a pen over here. It's usually, hang on. All right, so I'm going to write over here on the side. I had to get my graphics tablet out here. So usually... They just want a, it's not a very good A, but a resolute, Ooh, that's 
sounds rough. A resolution. To the issue. That they're upset about. So, I mean, usually when people are angry, it isn't necessarily that they're mad at you. So just kind of remember that. It's usually just that they're mad about something and they're going to probably take it out on you. But it's not personal. They usually just want a, a resolution to whatever it is that they're upset about. So just kind of, you know, always keep that in the back of your mind. So any conversation should end by summarizing the important points of the conversation and then thanking the caller as well. Um, and you want to make sure also that you never slam down the receiver. That shouldn't happen uh, even if you are uh, aware, even if you are sure that the caller has hung up before you and uh, or the caller may not have hung up before you, but even if you think that the caller has hung up before you and may not be aware of the action, people, man, my highlighting is everywhere over here. It's because I'm doing it with a mouse. That was a hot disaster right there. Uh, people in the lobby may be watching you, and they may take that the wrong way and think that you're just, like, super mad at whoever it is you're on the phone with and assume that it's a patient and that you are uh, just, like, angry hanging up the phone. So that's not good. Okay, so types of incoming calls. Uh, usually we get calls from patients. We get a lot of those. Uh, those will be received for various reasons. Scheduling, billing inquiries. Um, we get uh, requests to know results from labs, uh, from radiology testing. We get questions um, regarding, you know, uh, all kinds of things. So, like, um, sometimes out, like, uh, uh, what was I thinking about? Coordinating uh, uh, referral appointments also. And so those things, like, if they are trying to, if you, uh, if their their insurance is part as an HMO, then sometimes we have to coordinate referral appointments as well. So we get a lot of those um, types of calls from patients. So we want to make sure that we are assisting the patient according to any office policies and protocols. Uh, documentation is an important, important, important step. It's required for all telephone communication. Uh, we usually do this in the EHR, and so um, that's super easy to do. So uh, when we take phone calls, we usually pull up the patient's um, EHR. Let me move this over because this is so sloppy, and I'm sorry. I'm running out of space over here. So we pull up their EHR record and uh, make notes of the call. And then we um, uh, sometimes we will take prescription renewal calls, and those can come from the patient or directly from the pharmacy. So it's really bizarre. Uh, when we lived in the Midwest, the patients were responsible for calling um, for prescription refills. So anytime, like, I ran out of a prescription or my kids ran out of a prescription, we, I was responsible uh, as the patient to, or as the mother of a patient, to call and get prescription refills. The pharmacy never, um, very rarely would the pharmacy, I guess, I don't want to say never, but very rarely would the pharmacy call for a prescription refill. And so when we very first moved here, um, I ran out of a medication. And so I called my doctor's office and I said, hey, I'm out of this med. Can you call in a prescription refill? And, and the, um, the medical assistant at my doctor's office said, oh, you need to call Rite Aid and have Rite Aid call in for a refill. And I thought, what sense does that make? I'm calling you for a refill. Why does Rite Aid need to call? And so Apparently, that's how things work in California. So I called to Rite Aid, and Rite Aid's like, okay, we'll call your doctor and get a refill. 
and they did. And then I had medicine, and it was crazy. So I have come to find out that uh, the pharmacy is the one I need to call when I'm out of medication now, and the pharmacy calls the physician's office and gets uh, prescription refill authorizations and um, refills those medications now. So it's kind of crazy, but um, it's less hassle for me. I, I mean, it's kind of the same amount of work for me. I just call one place instead of the other now, but uh, the pharmacy is sometimes easier for me to get a hold of, I guess, or for a patient to get a hold of than the doctor's office sometimes. I don't know. But they can come from the um, patient or the pharmacy, I guess, depending on where you live. And uh, the chart should uh, be pulled and checked for prior authorizations. These are important. These have to do with um, insurances. And let me get a pen up here. These are, let me put a pen up. So prior authorizations are insurances. Oh, did my pen go? Where's my pen? Hold on. Pen, pen. And um, what these do, is uh, allows payment from the insurance. So without those prior authorizations, those uh, insurances won't cover those medications. Um, and that can, you know, significantly increase the cost of the medication for the patient. The patient uh, may call for advice on taking an old prescription or to ask about problems or symptoms. So here's, this is super important. I cannot stress this enough, especially because I'm dealing with this right now. Uh, ooh, that's ugly. I don't like it. Um, so medical assistants um, are not licensed to give medical advice or to prescribe medication. Um, and so you need to always refer them to a physician uh, and tell them that you will have the physician, you will relay the message to the physician and have the physician call them um, or the practitioner. If it's not the physician, it may be a nurse practitioner or, or a PA. I mean, but a practitioner will call, re return the call uh, with uh, after you've delivered the message. The patient should be encouraged to make an appointment to be seen as soon as possible. That's always important. I'm trying to highlight the important stuff here. If the patient refuses to come in, make a note of it. That's important also. That can help you in a mal malpractice suit later on. All right, so even though, um, actually, I'm going to go back over here. We're going to go over here first. Uh, oh, no, we'll go right here because uh, this is extra stuff that I put in there. Uh, even though use of an office telephone is never appropriate for personal calls, you want to follow the office policy for how to handle these calls. So attorneys may call, but you cannot release patient information to an outside caller unless asked to by the patient's provider. So this is important. Sometimes you get attorneys calling to ask for medical records. Um, you can't give them to them unless they have a subpoena and you have to have permission from the patient's provider. Other physicians may be calling in response to having seen a patient in consultation and those calls should be routed to the correct provider. So those important. Uh, because usually they're calling to follow up on a, on a consultation visit that they saw them for, and they're calling to share information regarding the patient's health. Calls from sale pe salespeople, such as pharmaceutical reps, should be handled according to office policy. Typically, the physicians will not, or the practitioners will not accept those calls, um, and so those will be uh, put through to voicemail or to uh, medical assisting or nursing staff. Uh, to take messages. 
Conference calls uh, may be scheduled for meetings, seminars, or other training. There's a lot of options such as GoToMeeting, Google Hangouts, Zoom. I use Zoom for this class. Um, so sometimes you may have to schedule conference calls. Uh, conference calls are becoming increasingly popular, popular because they don't require commuting or actually physically getting together. Everybody just kind of gets online and has a meeting that way. So it's a possibility you may have to uh, utilize those as well. So this stuff over here, um, this is just some extra things to um, be mindful of when you are thinking about uh, taking incoming calls. Um, complaints can occur in any office and the medical assistant should be prepared to listen carefully and write down the details of the problem. And so, you know, when you take phone calls, um, you never know what's going to be on the other end of that phone line when you pick the phone up. And so if somebody calls and they're complaining, you're just going to have to deal with it and you're going to have to um, listen very carefully, write down as many details of the problem as you can and understand that the patient's probably going to be upset, they're going to be angry and it's probably going to make you uncomfortable um, and just know that your job, your primary job should be to try to diffuse the situation and again like I pointed out up here, understand that they are not angry at you personally they're angry at whatever it is that they feel has been an injustice or a disservice to them. And they are really more uh, probably uh, importantly focused on trying to get a resolution to the problem or, you know, whatever it is. If on top of that, they're, it's, they're compounded, their anger is compounded by not feeling well, you know, you have to try to take into consideration all of these things and, and uh, stay calm in this situation. Listen carefully, acknowledge that you know that they're upset and, um, you know, speak very kindly and gently and you know let them speak their piece as as you know as much as they can and let them know that you care and you're going to do your best to correct the problem and uh, all the while you write down everything that you can and keep in the back of your mind that again that it is not about you personally and not become defensive even if they start directing things at you personally don't become defensive and then this is super important do not make promises you cannot keep um, so you don't want to say I can get this handled if you cannot in fact 100% get it handled don't say I can resolve this if you cannot 100% resolve the issue but you do want to let them know that you will um, you will work on the problem and uh, follow up promptly then as soon as you hang up follow up on the problem as promptly as you can inform the supervisor of any threats that are made uh, from the patient or uh, from whoever it is that called. Sometimes it's not the patient, sometimes it's a family member. And so uh, you want to inform the supervisor of any threats that are made if that happens and uh, just kind of make sure that you're documenting everything as you go. Fortunately that doesn't happen a whole lot but I just want to throw those things out there uh, in case those things do occur in your uh, office. All right, we are almost done. Where are we going? Where are we going? Down here. Okay. Uh, so managing incoming calls, when we have a uh, process uh, of screening calls, which involves deciding which calls are put through immediately and which calls are going to be handled by taking a message and then offering to give them a call back. And so generally all of the calls that come into the office belong to one of three groups and uh, those are administrative issues, emergency calls, and then calls related to clinical issues. So things like, you know, lab results or uh, test results or follow-up appointments or things like that. So if it's an emergency issue, the practitioner is going to need to attend to that. Those include any serious or life-threatening conditions, uh, calls from other providers, um, any calls from a patient to discuss test results, reports from patients who are not making satisfactory progress, uh, or requests for prescription renewals and also personal calls to the practitioner. So if it's like the practitioner's spouse or their children and it's a personal call, then you need to go get them and uh, get, let them attend to them. 
and uh, most practitioners will have set times in the schedule so that they can respond to any other calls that are not emergent, um, those routine calls, so that they can get back and return any other types of calls. You, as an MA, may be able to handle some of the administrative calls, such as appointments, questions on office policies, fees, hours, uh, and then some of the billing and insurance questions. If you're authorized, you can um, perhaps share x-rays and lab results along with reports from hospitals uh, regarding patient's progress or from a patient concerning progress. So I, when I worked as an MA, had um, did that. A lot. I spent a lot of time in the afternoons on the phone uh, returning phone calls and releasing test results to patients, lab reports to patients, um, calling in med refills to the pharmacies and doing things like that. So um, you also as a medical assistant may take requests for referrals to other doctors along with requests for prescription renewals uh, if prior approval for refills is noted in the chart. So you can do all of those things. Uh, you probably will do all of those things if you're working back office. Uh, so that's pretty much to be expected there. All right, so uh, a routing list is um, what will oops, what will help clarify who is responsible for handling each type of incoming call. The triage guidelines help to help exist to help with common questions as well as emergencies. So they kind of help guide you into figuring out whether or not uh, a patient should be seen in the office or if they should be directed to go straight to the emergency room. Um, and then also problems uh, can be categorized according to severity and uh, they must always be thoroughly documented as well. Uh, while they are being handled over the phone. So moving on to, where are we at? Taking a complete and accurate phone message. We start with uh, documenting calls is done according to office policy, of course, with the use of telephone message pads, a manual telephone log, or through an electronic phone messaging system. With the adoption, uh, uh, the adoption, excuse, excuse me, of uh, EHRs, mo most often this will be through an electronic telephone messaging system these days. Uh, sometimes message pads are still hanging around, um, but most often this will be through the EHR as well. Uh, to ensure accurate messages, uh, because we can email messages, that's why. Uh, to ensure accurate messages, we want to make sure that access to a pen and paper or the electronic system is immediate so that they're right there and ready to go. Information such as spelling of the caller's name should be verified. You want to pull the chart uh, or have access to the patient's electronic chart uh, to make sure that the correct patient is identified and that when you're on the phone um, uh, or and taking a message. Also verify the correct callback number by repeating that. State that the message will be delivered but do not ever promise a callback by another person and uh, make sure that the confidential confidentiality of phone messages is maintained and that the volume and area of the phone conversation is guarded with uh, confidentiality in mind at all times. Lastly, we talk uh, very briefly about placing outgoing calls and uh, when we try to figure out phone numbers, there used to be this thing called phone books and uh, those are kind of hard to come by these days. <laughs> I know that they uh, still make them because they show up in my driveway like once every couple years. Uh, but you can, uh, another name for those is telephone directories. Uh, uh, I think is, maybe the phone books are called directories, I'm not sure, but uh, you can um, try to use the phone book or a directory. You can, most of the time people just Google we use uh, the internet to look up a telephone number. You want to make sure that you double check the number before making a call uh, and also have a plan of whatever it is that you're going to discuss. Uh, that way you can make the call uh, as efficient as possible. You also want to 
allow enough time for someone to answer the telephone and then as soon as they pick up identify yourself immediately after the greeting with your name and the name of the doctor or the practice that you're calling from you want to ask if the caller has had has time for the call uh, or if you should call back if calling with information you want to make sure that you allow the person on the other end of the phone enough time to get a pencil and paper so that they can jot down the information that you're about to give them so um, you want to uh, when you call just say you know hi this is Jessica Lee I'm calling from Contra Costa family practice uh, I have uh, your lab results for you is this a good time to talk or would you prefer that I call you back oh it's a good time to talk great did you want to grab a pencil and paper so that you can write down the information that I'm about to give you and so I mean it's super simple uh, you know you just want to make sure that you're courteous while you are uh, talking with people if you have to leave a voicemail um, or leave a message on an answering machine you want to make sure that you're paying attention to HIPAA requirements and um, make sure that you check whether or not you are allowed to even leave any messages for the patient on their voicemail or machine per their uh, disclosure forms a patient may have authorized voicemail or others to receive information on their behalf if in doubt you should not leave any message at all um, if if you aren't sure you can simply uh, leave a message and say this message is for mrs jones please return the call to and leave your phone number don't identify yourself from any practice any facility any anything just leave a message for the name of the person and then leave your return phone number so um the medical assistant may uh, be the person retrieving messages from the answering system or the service in these cases for privacy reasons you do not ever want to use the speakerphone setting because people leave sensitive information sometimes on the voicemails in the office and if you have it on speakerphone then like everybody in the office is going to hear it you want to verify all information that was received uh, on those uh, voicemails or uh, from the answering service so just go back through return all the messages verify everything make sure everything was handled and taken care of if you are the person that is responsible for arranging a conference call you want to use a conference line where the host has a number which is different from the participants um, that's important and if you sh probably won't have to do that very often but if you do that's important and uh, if uh, you do have to um, arrange a conference call then an email should be sent to confirm arrangements and um, to make sure that that time is blocked off in the practitioner schedule so that's it all right so um, I think that is it for me uh, if you guys have any questions you can let me know um, and we can Zoom um, or uh, you can email me and I will do my best to answer them for you. Let me see if I can get out of here. No. Let me see if I can make this smaller for you so you can see the whole thing at once. All right. Yeah, there we go. Let me put this up here for you. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. All right. I don't know. That's all I got. Happy Chapter 14, guys. Thanks.